let's let's pray. Father, we just thank you because you are great and greatly to be praised. And I'm so glad that it's not up to me to impress your people. It's not up to me to deliver a word to your people. It's up to you. And so I pray, Father, that you would help us to have our expectation only in you. I pray, Lord God, that for each of us, whatever in the word is for us, that you would bring it out for us, that we would be fed, that we would be nourished, and that we would move on the things that you've given us to do. Um, we just thank you, Lord God. Bless the man and woman of God, not just today, Father, but let our hearts and our actions bless them continuously, Lord, that they would know that the people appreciate what you have given and that you would know we're grateful to you for them, Lord. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, praise the Lord. So um, I have this text and, and everything discerning the times, um, really considering God's will. But I was sitting there and I heard, what are you waiting for? It could have just been for me. Truly, it could have just been for me. Uh, I mean, really, it could have just been for me. <laughs> but I just heard that. What are you waiting for? And, and I heard little bits and pieces of it as we were going. So I am going to work through this, uh, but we're going to trust God to say what he actually wants to say today. Um, so let me start. I'm going to start from what I had at the end. I'm going to start a little backwards here. So um, I'm 45 years old. And I've been waiting for the will of the Lord. I've been waiting on God, you know, waiting on God to show me what direction to go in life, waiting on God to show me what direction in ministry he wants me to go, waiting on the Lord to show me how he wants to unfold this career thing. And, and truly all the waiting for relationship has been on his part. He's been waiting on me. I, that's, I confess that fully. But I've been waiting on the Lord, you know, um, and you get words from the Lord, you get people sharing what the Lord is saying about your life, and then you get little assurances along the way, and I've just been waiting for it to kind of unfold and manifest, and I got a lot of words when I was in high school, a lot of it was, you know, to get me through high school, and I got some words when I was in college and was kind of waiting for it to happen, and um, I was like, okay, so this is just going to happen, okay, and I had some, a whole lot of healings along the way, and I'm sure there are more to come, um, and just kind of sitting, waiting, just doing, keep your head down, you just do. And I looked up and I was in my 20s. And, you know, I was still waiting for the Lord to, to manifest and show me how he wants to unfold my life. And I looked up again and I was in my 30s. <laughs> and, but I was still waiting for the Lord to show me how this is going to unfold, how these gifts are going to start operating in my life and how, you know, m my future is going to come. I was waiting for my financial breakthrough. I was waiting for, you know, the timing of the Lord to show me. I was waiting to try to go out on my own because I was home for a while. And so I've been waiting for the Lord to do these things. And then I looked up again and I was 45. <laughs> so what was I waiting for God or maybe, maybe he was waiting for me. Now there is a process. There's a process for everything that God wants you to do. But sometimes the process is slower because of us and not because of God. And so the things that God is saying to us, the things that God is saying that he's going to do, and we're like, yes, God, you're going to do it. And so we sit down and we wait for it. And then God says something else, and we're like, well, I didn't see that, but you know what? I, I know I've been taught you're faithful, so you're going to do this, Lord God. And so then we sit over here and we wait for it. And we're waiting, waiting on Jesus, waiting at the presence of the Lord. Worship while you wait. Praise while you wait. Dance while you wait. But wait. But sometimes the waiting is actually God waiting for us. And he is so gracious that he will wait for us. And if it takes you 25 years, he'll wait. And if it takes you 50 years, he'll wait. And I, 
I was, this was coming to my mind and I was like, I don't know how this relates to anything that I have on these scriptures and I like to lay things out. I know exactly where I'm going today, you know. But I heard that at the end and I knew that he wanted to share, me to share that about my life that I think I have been thinking all this time that I've been waiting on the Lord, but he very kindly and gently let me know, actually, some stuff could have been in place a little sooner, but I was just kind of waiting for you. Some things could have been changed, but I was waiting for you. There is a time to wait, but then there's a time to take action. What we need to learn to do is discern which time we're in. So I have a text, and I was just reading through Isaiah. So if you turn to chapter 57, and um, I believe recently the apostle has given us some background on Isaiah, but I'm just going to kind of, while you're turning, Isaiah chapter 57, while you're turning, I'm just going to kind of briefly go through a little bit of background. Isaiah was a prophet um, for the nation of Judah. So Israel was an entire nation of the 12 tribes, and they split after Solomon's reign. So it was, it was Saul, David, Solomon. And after Solomon's reign, the nation was split, and they split into the, to the children of Israel, which was the bulk of the tribes. It was about 10 tribes. And then two tribes were Judah, and don't ask me to tell you which other one. So Benjamin, I can forget. Benjamin, it was Benjamin. So it was, it was Benjamin and Judah, and that's where they called, um, it was, so it was Judah. So it was Israel now, and it was Judah. Judah where Jerusalem was, et cetera. So God was dealing with some of the books in the Bible. The prophecies are directed toward Israel. Some are directed toward Judah. Now, Isaiah was in Judah, but his prophecies were directed really to the entire nation, like God's, all of God's people. Um, but largely it was written to the tribe of Judah because God was already dealing with Israel. Um, and I believe you heard the apostle say that, um, that this book mirrors the Bible, and that there are 66 books in the Bible. There are 66 chapters in this book. The first 39 books of the Bible deal with law and judgment. And then the last 22 have to deal with the comfort and the hope and the redemption. And the same is with the chapters. The first 39 deal with the judgment and the things that God is saying. And in, in Isaiah, the last 22 books deal with comfort and hope, the grace and the glory of God. Um, and so... Chapter 57 falls in that section of God's grace, okay? The grace and the glory, the promises that are to come. And if you don't know, a lot of the, um, the things that we know about Christmas, the prophecies that we, we know, uh, the, the little phrases we know, they come from Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah. Um, let's see. Um, sorry, it's not coming to my mind, but... Um, the government shall be on his shoulder and, you know, he will reign. That, those things come from Isaiah. So what was going on in Judah at the time, God had already started dealing with Israel and they weren't hearing. And so he led them into captivity. I don't know exactly the timeline, but he was trying to deal with Jerusalem. Jerusalem held out a little bit longer. You know, they were able to turn to God a few more times longer, but they still ended up in the same situation. So what was going on right now is that they were kind of living, living loosely. They were offering their sacrifices to God. But they were kind of doing what they wanted to in the meantime, right? So they were going through this ritual um, or religion, but they were kind of doing what they wanted every other time, like for the rest of the time. And so he was trying to get them to, to come in line. So, um, and then in the meantime, they were under um, oppressive rulers. Some of the leaders weren't godly, so they were doing stuff that they had no business doing and oppressing the people. And so chapter 57, verses 1 and 2 was, this is the situation they were in, and it says, the righteous perisheth, and no man layeth it to heart. And merciful men are taken away, none considering that the righteous is taken away from the evil to come. He shall enter into peace. They shall rest in their beds, each one walking in his uprightness. Um, the New Living Translation says, good people pass away. The godly often die before their time, but no one seems to care or wonder why. No one seems to understand that God is protecting them from the evil to come. And then in the New Living, it says those who follow godly paths will rest in peace when they die. But let's take rest in a now context because God said in Hebrews, there remains a rest to the people of God. 
So I was just reading, and I was like, I never really noticed this scripture. He's saying, good people die, the righteous die, and people aren't really paying attention to it. But the scripture says, precious in the eyes of the Lord is the death of his saints. Meaning that whenever one of his own people dies, he's looking at it. He's attending to it. It's not careless. It's not haphazard. Even if their passing was calamitous, even if their passing was um, too soon, according to us, even if it was through an accident or through violence, when his people die, his eyes are on that situation. So now what happens to those of us who are here when God's people are passing, when they're facing through these things, there are a couple of ways you could look at that text, but I'm going to look at it in this way. The people of God are passing, but nobody's paying attention to what God is trying to say in the midst of it, right? Because if, if he's attentive to it, that means there's something that I need to be attentive to as well as a believer who is left behind when his people have, are passing, you know, and in this situation, all kinds of people are passing and it's not just through COVID. All kinds of crazy accidents are happening and people are losing their lives. Good people, bad people, evil people, great people, people of God, people who are not of God. But when the people of God die, we are to pay attention to it. And we are to start saying, okay, Lord, I know you care about us and I know you care about what's going on. So I'm seeing these things happen. Tell me what, tell me what I need to know. Tell me what action I need to take. That is discerning the times. That is a part of, not the only thing, but it is a part of discerning the times. We don't just say, okay, when my mom passed, we don't just say, dang, that was terrible. Well, moving on. I don't mean the grief part of it. I'm talking about acknowledging that something has happened in the kingdom of God. One of his saints has left this earth. Why, I wonder? And I don't mean like, why, Lord, did you take it from me? I mean, what is it that I need to learn in the midst of this situation that is going forward? Is there something that I need to alter in my behavior? Is there anything that I need to be aware of, alert to in this situation? It's not just about shaking our head. You know, it's not just about saying, man, this world is evil. But to acknowledge, you know, sometimes he's actually moving people out because some things are going down that he doesn't want them to have to deal with. But if that is the case, we're here, we're going to have to deal with it. We need to know how to be equipped for it, right? Because we're still here fighting the good fight. So we want to make sure that we're equipped properly to do it and not to just be like, man, I feel so bad for sister so-and-so because she lost her this. I feel so bad for brother so-and-so because he lost his this. I feel so bad for that ministry because they lost their pastor to COVID. And it's been happening. Entire families. But what are we to get out of the times that we're living in? The turmoil in the country, the civil unrest, the government that doesn't quite have a handle on things. It doesn't matter who's in office, it has nothing to do with it. It's a sign of the times. So what sign, if, the, if it's a sign of the times, are we reading the signs? Are we discerning what is going on or are we just saying, man, mm, terrible that happened to you, but we just can keep chugging along, waiting on God waiting on God because I'm going to wait for my change to come but change is coming all around us am I changing in the middle of it so I was reading a commentary and he said the death of good men is a thing to be laid to heart it's, it's to be considered more than common deaths serious inquiries ought to be made See, when one of God, one of our own dies, we're supposed to say, okay, I need to find, I need to make some serious inquiries as to what is going on, not in the natural, but in the spirit, in the spirit. We're children of the spirit. Everybody knows the world is going crazy. Sinners could tell you that. But we, the people of God, are to have something more to say about it, something more to do, because we are people of action. So... We are meant to discern the times that we're living in. We're not supposed to be saying, oh, what's going on? And I admit, that has come out of my mouth. I'm like, I don't even know what's going on around here because this is going over here and that's going over here. And they're saying this is all topsy-turvy and things are upside down and people are completely confused about who they are. 
And I have to deal with it on a regular basis. Most of us do. So how do I know that we're supposed to know what's going on? If you turn to Luke chapter 12, and we're going to go down to verse 54. And while you're turning to Luke chapter 12, I'm going to read to you um, the Greek t uh, term for discern that is used in these scriptures, okay, in these verses. Discern comes from a Greek word that means to test, examine, prove, or scrutinize to see whether a thing is genuine or not. It also means to recognize as genuine after examination to approve or deem worthy. But let's focus on this testing, to test, to examine, to prove, to scrutinize. That's discerning. So in Luke chapter 12, verse 54 through 56, he says, and he said to the people, when you see a cloud rise out of the west, straightway or immediately you say, there, there comes a shower, it's about to rain. And so it is. And when you see the south wind blow, you say, oh, there's going to be heat. And sure enough, that's what happens. You hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky and of the earth, but how is it that you do not discern this time? That's how I know that the Lord expects us to know what's going on. So we are to test and scrutinize this time, not just shake our heads. And sometimes you do have to turn the news off. Because if all you hear is CNN or Fox or whatever network you choose, CNBC, whatever, the local news networks, if that's what you're pumping into your system all the time, how do you know what's going on? You just know what's happening as a result of what's going on. What's going on is in the spirit. You're just seeing the effects of it here. So just knowing the news doesn't tell you what's going on. You're children of the spirit. So in the spirit, we need to connect to God and find out what's really going on, right? What's really going on? And how do I adjust my actions and my lifestyle to what's going on? So this tells me that Jesus, that the Lord expects us to know the times. Um, Ephesians 5, verses 15 through 17 and I'm going to read this in the Amplified Bible. Ephesians 5, verses 15 through 17. Now, I am, I've been in this ministry all, well, since it started. I have been hearing the word of the Lord. I, I read the word. I'm, I'm learning the word. I'm understanding the word. And I'm living holy. But I'm waiting on the Lord. I'm, I'm not doing anything wrong. The Lord has been gracious to keep me, right? I'm not cussing anybody out. I'm not treating people poorly, but I'm just waiting on the Lord in the midst of things moving along. And I look up, I'm a decade older. I look up, I'm another decade older. I look up, I'm another five years older. So Ephesians 5, 15 through 17 says, and I'm reading Amplified. Therefore, see that you walk carefully living with honor, purpose, and courage, shunning those who tolerate and enable evil, not as the unwise, but as wise, sensible, intelligent, discerning people, sensible, intelligent, discerning people, making the very most of your time on earth, recognizing and taking advantage of each opportunity and using it with wisdom and diligence, because the days are filled with evil. Therefore, do not be foolish and thoughtless, but understand and firmly grasp what the will of the Lord is. So the Lord expects us to know what is going on. He expects us to discern the times, not the prophets, not the pastors, not those in the fivefold ministry, it, this was directed to every believer. So it's my obligation as a believer to, to know the times. So um, if we jump back to the condition of Judah when Isaiah was writing to them, uh, the next chapter in Isaiah 58, 
Remember, this is in the this is in the section that deals a lot with the grace of God, the glory of the Lord that's to come. This admonition is coming in the middle of that. And I I don't want well I can't I can't help how you receive it, but I will say that there's nothing negative intended in this. But I am going to read, and this is kind of lengthy, so I'm going to kind of read through this Isaiah 58, and I, I want you to hear, I want you to hear what the Lord wants you to hear, but hear the spirit of what is being said in this chapter. Shout with the voice of uh, the trumpet blast. Again, I'm reading New Living Translation. Shout aloud, don't be timid. Tell my people Israel of their sins. They act so, yet they act so pious. Pious meaning religious, you know, holy. They come to the temple every day and seem delighted to learn all about me. They act like a righteous nation that would never abandon the laws of its God. They ask me to take action on their behalf, pretending they want to be near me. We fasted before you, they say. Why aren't you impressed? We've been very hard on ourselves and you don't even notice it. I will tell you why, I respond. It's because you're fasting to please yourselves. Even while you fast, you keep oppressing your workers. I hear the spirit of what is being said, okay? What good is fasting when you keep on fighting and quarreling? This kind of fasting will never get you anywhere with me. You humble yourselves by going through the motions of penance, meaning repentance, bowing your heads like reeds bending in the wind. You dress in burlap and cover yourself with ashes. That uh, for them was a sign of mourning, that they were in sorrow. Is this what you call fasting? Do you really think this will please the Lord? No, this is the kind of fasting I want. Free those who are wrongly imprisoned. Lighten the burden of those who work for you. Let the oppressed go free and remove the chains that bind people. Share your food with the hungry and give shelter to the homeless. Give clothes to those who need them and do not hide from relatives who need your help. That's interesting. <laughs> then your salvation will come like the dawn. This, listen to this. What will happen if I'm not just waiting on God? Coming to church, being faithful, keep my head down, go to work, go to church, be faithful, keep my head down, keep waiting on the Lord. This is what's going to happen. Then your salvation will come like the dawn and your wounds will quickly heal. Your godliness will lead you forward and the glory of the Lord will protect you from behind. Then when you call, the Lord will answer, yes, I am here. He will quickly reply. Remove the heavy yoke of oppression. Stop pointing your finger and spreading vicious rumors. Feed the hungry and help those in need. Then your light will shine out from the darkness. And the darkness around you will be as bright as noon. The Lord will guide you continually, giving you water when you're dry and restoring your strength. You will be like a well-watered garden, like an ever-flowing spring. Some of you will, re will rebuild the deserted ruins of your cities. Then you will be known as a rebuilder of walls and a restorer of homes. You know, the spiritual HGTV. <laughs> uh, keep the Sabbath holy. Don't pursue your own interests on that day, but enjoy the Sabbath and speak of it with delight as the Lord's holy day. Honor the Sabbath in everything you do on that day and don't follow your own, own desires or talk idly. Then the Lord will be your delight. Yeah. I will give you great honor and satisfy you with the inheritance I promised to your ancestor, Jacob. I, the Lord, have spoken. So what is God addressing in this? How does this relate? I'm, you know, I'm not abusing anyone and I don't have anybody under me that I'm oppressing. Like, I don't think my students are oppressed, you know. But... What is the spirit of what God is saying? The spirit of what God is saying is, I want you to know what's going on and I want the motivation for the things that you're doing for me to be truth, yeah. right? David said, God, yea, you desire truth in the inward parts. The inward parts. You know, it's great that we are coming faithfully, Keeping up, you know, keeping the house of the Lord. We're doing these things, but God wants us. He wants the heart. He doesn't want that to just become a ritual or religion. He wants us to understand the times we're living in and know when we are to, to wait on God and know when we are to move. So do you find yourself in the same place that you were in 
like me? Well, not, I'm not really in the same place now, but do you find yourself in the same place that you were in maybe 10 years ago, maybe five years ago? If you're young, do you still have trouble figuring out what in the world you're going to do with your life? It took me a long time. I mean, a long time. A long time. A long time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, but let me just give you an example, okay? And some of you have heard this ad nauseum, but I didn't want to teach, but I'm called to it. And once I finally did it, I realized I was called to it. I taught for a while, but then I felt like, mm, yeah, that's the Lord telling me to move. So I did, but it wasn't. It wasn't him. So for two years, I thought I was taking steps, and I wasn't. I was just treading water. When I got another full-time, decent-paying job, guess where I was? In the exact same spot. Not the same location, but the same spot. I wasn't discerning my times. Clearly, I moved when I wasn't supposed to. But what happened was the Lord wanted to bring me into something in that, but I wasn't ready. When I say ready, I mean willing. I wasn't willing to go there. I didn't want to do leadership. Yeah, but I'm called to that too, you know? And so, it, so then I had to go, go back it, humbly after two years and trying to pay some bills and all of this stuff. And I had to come back to, and I was like, I can't believe this. This is like the same thing, but just a different building over my head. Because it just wasn't, I, I didn't discern the times properly. And so I was there, but God in his great mercy is working me up. He's still giving me favor. And now, guess what I'm doing? I'm in a program for leadership. So, and it's great, right? It's great, but... You know, if I had stayed where I was, I probably would have already been in leadership. But I moved. So he was like, okay, no problem. See, the good thing about God is that he really does work all things together for your good. So he, he worked some good in those two years. And I can look back on him and see the good that he did. But he probably would have done me a little better if I had stayed where I was supposed to at the time. Um, so... I'm, I'm where I am. I'm thankful for it. I have no regrets or in that sense, okay? I do wish I had followed him the first time, but I wasn't always hearing clearly. I wasn't always discerning my times, and I wasn't always willing to go in the direction that I felt that he wanted me to go. So my prosperity in the natural and the spiritual could be tied, it is tied, to my obedience and my willingness to go. And I heard a message and, um, that was shared with me, and the man of God said, and I may get the wording wrong, but he said, God will allow you to stay wherever you're willing to settle. In other words, if I had been willing to settle for not walking in teaching, not walking in leadership, he would have allowed me to stay there. I wouldn't have been that happy, but he would have allowed me to stay there. But if there is greater, then I have to discern the time that I'm in and find out what God wants me to do because he may not, I'd love to know exactly where I'm going, but he may not tell me exactly where I'm going. I do just need to know when it's time to move. Okay, so that was the situation of Israel, but the promise is there. The promise is what I want you to see, that as if Israel, excuse me, if Judah would have heeded what he was saying there and heard the spirit of what he was saying. He's saying, I don't have a problem with your sacrifices that you're doing. I have a problem with the spirit in which you're doing them. Um, I'm going to take us to Psalms chapter 50. And just to kind of further illustrate that, Psalm chapter 50, I would love to read the whole thing, but what I'm going to do is give you a little kind of summary of some of it, and then I'll read starting at verse 14. So in the first seven verses or so, God is calling a solemn assembly to his people um, so that he can judge their works, all right? Excuse me, he calls the host of heaven to witness to the fact that he is a righteous judge. So he's like, I want all my people to come. 
but I call the host of heaven to, in other words, he's saying, I'm about to say something in my, in my, in my role as judge over my people, but I call heavens to witness that I am a righteous judge, meaning nothing that I'm saying is unjust. Verses 7 through 13, he begins to talk to his people and he begins to let them know. This is, he said, I don't really have a problem with your sacrifices that you constantly offer to me or your physical service to me. But what he told him, you know that scripture, you'll find in those verses, um, if, I, if I were hungry, I wouldn't tell you. Because all the cattle on the hills, they all belong to me. That's in that scripture in the context. He's saying, I don't have a problem with your sacrifices, but you need to understand I don't need them. Because they had to offer natural sacrifices. So he's saying, you're doing it faithfully, and that's great. But some of them kind of started to get like, well, you know, you're, I'm kind of doing God a favor here. I'm, I'm giving the best, and we could be having a good feast off of this lamb. This is a spotless lamb. It's all fat. You're giving the sacrifices. But he said, I don't have a problem with the actual sacrifices. But I need to let you know that it's not in the sacrifices that I find value. It's not just in the religious effort that God finds value. It's in the spirit in which we serve. So verse 14 says, make thankfulness your sacrifices to God. And keep the vows that you made to the most high. Then call on me when you're in trouble. And I will rescue you and you will give me glory. But God says to the wicked, mind you, these are still all his people. God says to the wicked, why bother reciting my decrees and pretending to obey my covenant? For you refuse my discipline and treat my words like trash. I'm reading New Living Translation. When you see thieves, you approve of them and you spend your time with adulterers. And he was referring to people who worship idols. Your mouth is filled with wickedness and your tongue is full of lies. You sit around and slander your brother, your own mother's son. While you did all this, I remained silent. And you thought I didn't care. You know, I've heard students, my mama don't care. Then I called the mama and the mama did care. <laughs> so I remained silent and you thought I didn't care. But now... I will rebuke you, listing all my charges against you. Repent, all of you who forget me, or I will tear you apart and no one will help you. But giving thanks is a sacrifice that truly honors me. If you keep to my path, I will reveal to you the salvation of God. There's a beautiful promise in that. Only God can give you a beautiful promise while he's, you know, giving you a beating. And, and I love my parents, my, the ones who raised me when I was little. But I didn't get any promises when I got beaten. I got promised that if you did it again, you're going to get another beating. <laughs> but, so, but look at the beauty of God. He's telling you the outcome when we change our direction, when we begin to see the times that we're living in, when we begin to shed off the religious spirit, and we begin to serve him in the spirit of what he is saying. See, because he loves that we are here, that we're not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. He loves it that when you come to the house of God, you lift your hands in worship. But he doesn't want you to think that it's in that that you are pleasing him. It is in the heart with which you do it that you are pleasing him. So what does this have to do with discerning the times? I'm looking at all this calamity around me. I'm looking at all this death around me. And is it, is it really time for me to just come to the house of the Lord? Is it, is it really a time for me to just shake my head about the ills of our nation and our world? Or maybe I should go back to God and say, okay, Lord, what are you saying to me about what I need to be doing in this time? So he wants the motivation to what, for what we're doing to be truth in the inward parts. And he wants us to begin to consider our character. Yes. Our character. That is what really reflects Christ to others. Because thousands upon thousands of people go to church all the time. There are people who are going to a, a non-Christ-centered church faithfully. There are people who are not in the household of faith 
who do their religion faithfully. There are people who are winning souls for their cause faithfully. But what is the distinction between them and us? Yes, it's the blood of Jesus. Yes, it's the cross of Calvary. But when someone is standing before you and another person is standing before you, how do you know which one belongs to God? You should know by their character. You should know because they don't just say, well, if I, you know, when I wasn't saved, if I had been the way I used to be, obviously you kind of still are. But they humble themselves before God. They hold their peace sometimes. When you know they could cut you with their words. The character. So why are we going through so much? The character. The character. So he wants us to consider the times that we're living in. What adjustments do I need to make in the spirit of what I'm doing for God? How am I serving God? Am I caught up in legalism? Am I so used to just doing the right thing that I forgot why I'm doing the right thing? I need to go to Romans. I need to go to Galatians and find out what grace did for me. So that now the right thing, that's why he said in Psalms uh, 50 verse 14, make thankfulness your sacrifices to God. He's saying, "Mm, remember why you're doing it. What else should I consider? How am I praising God? I'm a praiser. Why am I praising God? Am I praising him because they keep telling me that praise is going to bring me the breakthrough? Or have I made thankfulness my sacrifice to God and I'm praising him just because? And then I start seeing that breakthrough. See, because he said, you know, you're doing these these sacrifices. And Isaiah, he said, you're doing them. You're fasting and you're saying, we fasted. What, 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 what? You're not responding. But he's saying, yeah, but you're just doing it to get what you want. So... What else do I need to consider? Where am I in my walk with God? Am I still struggling to do something that he's been asking of me? I'm not talking about, if you don't know, you don't know. You need to go to the Lord and find out. But if you know, why is my marriage still having trouble when I know the Lord prophesied that it was going to be all right? I was waiting on the Lord. I was waiting on the Lord to change my spouse. I was waiting on the Lord to show me a sign that he was doing what he was going to do so I could have faith that he was going to finish. But I wasn't discerning my times because he told me to forgive. And every time they act up, I'm like, I can't forgive that. Or he told me to honor and love. And every time their mouth opens, I'm like, see, you want me to love that? Or he told me to obey my parents, but they get on my nerves. They're not right. So is God telling me to do something that I haven't responded to because I haven't discerned the time that I'm living in and I'm just waiting on God? All of my holy time, I will wait for my change. But, 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 is all of your time holy? You know, are you really walking in holiness this whole time? I'm a child, I'm a teenager, and I'm just muttering under my breath. Every time my parents say something, I have an attitude. All all of our lives are committed to God. Not our Sunday lives, not our public lives, but when you're at home and people are working your nerves, you are still a child of God. You are still a believer. You still have... A call on your life to walk in holiness to to the Lord, before the Lord. So maybe I haven't been earning more money because I didn't want to do the leadership thing when he wanted me to. So he couldn't bless me in that way. So I had to just stay there. Because I didn't want the trouble that goes along with that. You know, I know how people are. So you don't want the trouble. That means you don't want the blessing that comes along with it either. Because you can't get it both ways. God's not going to suck all the trouble out for you so you can just enjoy all of the sugar. It's not going to happen. So then I have to make up my mind that regardless of what the trouble is, I know that this is what you're calling me to do. And so I humble myself and I'm just going to go on through it. I'm just going to do it. And and I got a little pushback initially from, there was a situation, I get along with everybody on my job. 
Really, I do. And then uh, there was a situation that popped up. I was like, what, 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 what? What is going on? Because you said yes. <laughs> you said yes. So now I have to determine how I'm going to deal with it. And then I had to go back to God. After I did the initial dealing with it on the surface, then I had to go back to God so he could deal with it under my surface. <laughs> <laughs> So that I could be the light that I'm supposed to be in every situation. So what am I supposed to discern? What is the Lord speaking to me? Do I even know? It took me so long. I used to, oh, I used to talk to my dad and he used to be like, oh, what is the Lord saying? I'm like, oh, come on. I don't know. That's what you're here for. Tell me. Gosh. He knows it's the truth. I know that he's asked some of you what the Lord is saying. And you're like, Pastor, that's why I'm calling you. <laughs> but it's not up to him to tell you what God wants you to do in your life. When he stands before God, he's going to be absolved, okay? He's going to be clean. Because he told you what the Lord told him to tell you. What you were supposed to find out from God, are you finding that out? Some things you just have to go to the office and take care of business for yourself. You can't send somebody. I'm learning. <laughs> I'm learning. I'm learning not to call my dad every time I want to hear from the Lord. Hey, daddy. <laughs> now I'll say, dad, can you just pray with me about this, this such and such and thing? I'm just praying about such and such. Click. Then if the Lord wants to tell him, he'll tell him. Don't get me wrong. I'm still very relieved every time that happens. But I'm learning that I have to hear what God is saying to me. And I need to know how he's saying things to me. How are you going to know? You're not just going to burst forth. I'm waiting on the Lord, waiting on the Lord. And all of a sudden, one day, just like an egg cracking open, I'm just going to burst out fully in my ministry, fully in my calling, fully in my finances. Everything's just going to poof. But it's not going to happen that way. So I have to learn how God is talking to me. I have to learn how to discern the times. And he's going to walk me through it. He's already made the promises of what's going to happen when I do, but I got to do it. I got to do it. So how do we know what's going on around the spiritual? How are we going to get to understand the mind of God? How do we figure this out? You know, I'm only, I'm only a teenager. I'm just a young adult. And I, I just thought you were supposed to wait till you were in your 30s. But you're here now. What are you going to do? You're going to wait on the Lord like I did for a couple of decades and then figure it out later? Not a good idea. Trust me. It's painful. So, how do we discern what's going on around us spiritually? The first thing that we can do is remain humble and dependent on God. Amen. Matthew eleven twenty five 25 says, At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and hast revealed them unto babes, babies who are innocent, babies who don't really know unless you lead them there. So we're to remain humble and dependent on God. If I get too smart, I might miss what God is saying. A tendency of mine, you know, I like to be clever, clever with my words, but I am to remain humble and dependent on God. And then he'll reveal it to the babes. The Bible says, as newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word. So we're hungry for God. We're humble before God. It's not, mm, I done heard this message before, and you already, you shut down and tune out. Checked out, because I already passed this test. Check. I already heard it. I already know where he's going. I could preach it for him. But I'm to remain humble and dependent on God. And he'll reveal some things to me. How else can I discern? I can walk in the spirit. I must walk in the spirit, meaning walk, meaning live, meaning be connected to the spirit. Okay, being in tune with the spirit. That's what walking in the spirit means. No, wait a minute. Being in tune with the spirit and operating on that which we hear. Okay. First Corinthians chapter two, verses nine and 10. Say, but as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. Verse 10 says, but 
God has revealed them unto us by his spirit. For the spirit searches all things. Yea, the deep, the profound things of God, the things that are beyond human understanding, the spirit searches those things. And so as I connect with the spirit, then he reveals them to me. That's how I'm discerning the time. So I'm humble before God. I'm, a, I'm humble as a babe because I, I, I don't mind being a part of the not many wise, right? Not many mighty. I don't mind being a, a part of the foolish and the weak because those are the people he's discerning. He's revealing things to. The ones who are like babies. A third thing that I can do to be able to discern the time that I'm living in, the time, my timing, is to be prepared to act on what I understand. Be prepared to act on what you understand. What we hear across this pulpit and what we understand, what you read in the word of God and what you understand, what you hear and you know is from God and you understand you are responsible for. So Genesis chapter 18, verses 17 and 19, through 19. Genesis chapter 18, verses 17 through 19. We're talking about being prepared to act on what we understand. And the Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him that he will command his children and his household after him. And they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham. Hmm. They shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he had spoken of him. The Lord chose to reveal something to Abraham because he knew that he could trust Abraham with the information and if, that, if there was any action that needed to be taken on what he shared, that Abraham would not just do it for himself and say, I got mine, you get yours. Abraham was going to command his family and his entire household to do the same thing. That's why God was able to tell Abraham things that he didn't necessarily reveal. Listen, let's contrast that. What was he talking about? He was saying, shouldn't we tell Abraham what's about to go down with Sodom and Gomorrah? But he didn't tell Lot until the last minute. They were both considered righteous. But see, he knew that Abraham would act on it if he needed to. And immediately Abraham went to interceding when he found out what was going to, are you, whoa, whoa, you're going to destroy a whole city? Whoa, 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 what if there were a hundred righteous people? What if there were 90? And he went all the way down so they couldn't get as, he got down as low as he could because he immediately took action on the information that God gave him in intercession. So if God reveals a calamity to me, am I going to get some popcorn, sit back and wait for it to happen? Yeah, he told me. Or am I going to start interceding, looking for a breakthrough, find a way to stand in the gap or to take some action that is going to please God, that is going to further his will and his kingdom? So the contrast to Abraham was Lot. He told Lot at the very last minute. Why? Because it didn't matter. Lot was going to do the same thing if he had found out a week before, a month before, a year before. Lot would have still been in Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of, resting his laurels, waiting on God, and not rescuing. Look, he couldn't even get his sons-in-law to do the same thing. So God didn't reveal it to him. He just sent his messengers on the day of, we need you to get out of here. Do you not know that Lot dragged his feet so much that they literally had to grab him by the hand and drag him, like take him out of the city? How do you know that God might reveal something to you because he knows he can trust you to take some action on it? According to his will now, okay? But he can trust that you're not just going to take the information and sit on it and feel good that you know something. So Lot didn't get that same information and it was affecting him directly. And he barely got out by the skin of his teeth and still lost his wife in the process. So 
Can God trust me with the information that he gives me? Can he trust me to act on what he's saying? Why do I need God to reveal something to me when, when he told me to forgive, I wouldn't? Why do I need a deep revelation of my purpose in God when he told me, listen, I want you to reach out and start calling people, and I wouldn't because I was afraid, because I had been hurt, because people say things that hurt your feelings. They're not nice. So why do I need a deeper revelation? I just need to walk in the revelation he's given me and humble myself and become hungry for him and make sure that my service is in spirit and not just the letter and he'll start opening things up to me and I'll start discerning the time that I'm living in. So what, what, what are you talking about? Like what's going on here? What, what are you even saying? Are you saying I'm not doing what I'm supposed to do? Yeah, I'm saying you're doing what you're supposed to do, and this is for whoever it is for whom, you know, for who, to whoever it is. may not be every single one of us. You're doing what you're supposed to do, but you're not in tune with the Spirit of God because there's more. Or maybe there's just different. And my blessing lie in my obedience to God. I found my purpose when I finally gave in and started teaching. Love it. I love it in the secular realm, and I'm able to benefit from it in the kingdom. I know what I'm supposed to do. But it took me a few years to finally yield to what he wants. So is that me waiting on God or not? So I was thinking about, I was like, okay, what are you saying, though? I was like, how in the world is this coming together? What are you saying? I, I was thinking about this little sticker or saying, I don't know if it was when I was in elementary school. I mean, I don't know. I was caught being good. I was caught being good. You know, whenever somebody does something nice, they give you the little sticker or whatever the reward it is, and it says, I was caught being good. You know, it, people like to catch you in doing something bad, but these were to reward students for doing good things so that they would feel encouraged to do more. And he was like, that's what I want. He wants to catch us doing his will. When the, when the times are crazy, when things happen, what will he catch us doing? Will he catch me keeping my head down, doing the same thing, waiting on the Lord? Or will he catch me being discerning, finding out what I need to do because of the things that are going on? He wants to catch us doing good. Will he catch me just serving him in the letter because that's what I'm used to and I know how to do that? And I mean, I love the Lord, but I forgot why I'm doing it. We won't have to worry about the times we're living in if we're in that position that we're whatever, whatever it is that's going on. We're going to be caught doing what God wants us to do individually. We won't have to worry about the things, that, the calamities that are coming. Because I know that what I am doing right now in my life is what God wants me to do. Where I am in my life is where he wants me to be. I'm not waiting on God to do everything for me so that I can finally obey him. But I'm obeying him now so that he can do everything for me. Because in your obedience lies your blessing. In your obedience lies your blessing. It's not about earning a blessing, but it's about cause and effect. You're not earning your blessing, you're blessed. But the manifestation of it, some things cause other things to happen. And so my obedience will cause things to be in line so that he can start blessing me. But if I am out of order, he will not bless me out of his order. He will not. So I'm responsive to him. I'm sensitive to him when I know he's talking to me. Even when it hurts a little bit, I still, want, I still yield, I still do. When he asked me to move on something, oh, I really don't want to do that. But I'm like, okay, Lord, I'm going to do this, but you got to help me. But I'm going to do it. He can trust me with information because he knows I will act on it according to his will. And this is at any age. This is wherever I am. I am supposed to be able to discern the times that I'm living in and find out my place in that time. So I want to read 2 Peter chapter 3. I want to read it, but I don't have it written down. Oh, yes, I do. Okay. And again, I'm going to read from the New Living Translation. Verse, I'm going to start at verse 8. See, there is a lot going on. 
And a lot of what we're going through is really tough. And I don't even know what everyone is dealing with. But I need to be discerning if I am going through, what is it? What kind of character are you trying to work in my life through this? So that I can cooperate with it, you know, and yield to it. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 8. But you must not forget this one thing, dear friends. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years is like a day. And what that's really saying is that God doesn't exist in time. Time is for us. Time is not an issue for God. Verse 9, the Lord isn't really being slow about his promise, as some people think. No, he's being patient for your sake. He doesn't want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. But the day of the Lord will come as unexpectedly as a thief. Then the heavens will pass away with a terrible noise and the very elements themselves will disappear in fire and the earth and everything on it will be found to deserve judgment. Since everything around us is going to be destroyed like this, what holy and godly lives you should live. How you should be caught being good. And so, dear friends, verse 14, and so, dear friends, while you are waiting for these things to happen, make every effort to be found living peaceful lives that are pure and blameless in his sight. Make every effort to be, to be found living peaceful lives. There does remain a rest to the people of God. There are great blessings. This is the appointed time. This is the time that God will bless his people and manifest his miraculous provisions and the increases in our finances and our good jobs and businesses. And I will add our good relationships. This is that appointed time. But what he wants for us is us to consider. And then consider and know that the things that are going, that are going on are not just happening for no reason at all. And once we've considered then we're going to adjust our own lifestyle. We're going to adjust our actions. We're going to adjust our behavior and allow him to adjust our character. We're not just waiting for our change to come. And so when we do this, when we begin to yield to the Lord and begin to see that we are people of purpose and that if something is going on in my life, there is a purpose in it. I need to find out what the purpose is. Is the purpose to get me to obey because it really was only happening because I was disobedient? Or is the purpose to work a specific character in my life? Then I need to find out what it is. If it's patience, then I need to wait and stop saying, God, when are you going to do it, Lord? When are you going to do it, Lord? Because that's not going to work the purpose of God, right? Because patience is what he wants. Then I will shift and adjust myself and say, Lord, I thank you for the grace to wait. But if he wants me to take some action, then I'm going to discern that. And I'm going to say, maybe the reason I didn't get into the school that I wanted is because he wants me here or he wants me somewhere else. So then I go to God and I say, okay, Lord, I didn't get this job. I didn't get into this school. This door didn't open for me. This business license didn't come through. What's the next step? Because the things that we do for God, he loves that we are doing it. But he wants us to remember the why, the spirit behind why we're doing it. And then your light will shine forth as the noonday. Then he will work mighty, wondrous things at his hand on your behalf. Then he will open doors that no man can shut, and he will shut doors that no man can open. Then he will cause your light to shine right then you can say arise shine for your light has come for the glory of the Lord is risen upon you hallelujah when we consider the times that we're living in and learn to discern praise God God is good he's faithful he's he's really faithful he, he's really 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 faithful what a great God that won't pressure you what a great God that will literally wait as long as it takes to a point for you to do his will. But when time is getting short, then he'll just nudge you a little bit more so that you understand that now the urgency is different than it was. I can't afford to wait 25 more years. I can't afford to wait 25 more years. So he just graciously nur nur urges me a little bit more. 
So I just wanna, want us to, to pray and just agree in prayer, agree with God this morning, this afternoon. Father, we just thank you. We thank you for this great salvation that we live. We thank you for this walk. We thank you, God, that our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Because we could not do this life without you. Absolutely could not do this without you. And so we're calling on you. We're dependent upon you. We know that we need you, Lord God. I acknowledge my need. I acknowledge that I can't say anything. I can't do anything. I can't even want to serve you without your grace. Without your mercy being extended to me daily. And I thank you that you're going to help me get to the place that you want me to be. But I understand that I cannot afford to just keep waiting, but that I must hear from you. And so I pray, Lord God, that you would help our spiritual ears. Help us to connect, Lord God. Help us not to just serve you out of practice, but to serve you out of spirit. Help us to not just wait and sit when you are asking us to move. Help us, Lord God, not to go ahead of you because we think we know what you're planning when we don't. Forgive us, oh God, for not being willing for you to work the character in us that we need to sustain the glory that you will show forth in our lives. Forgive us for using the spiritual disciplines as a way to just get what we want. And help us, oh God, to walk in truth, to discern the times that we are living in, to know what we're about and for whom we walk this walk. Help us to represent you well when we are in public and when we are at home. Help us to represent you well when there is no pressure to perform and when there's so much pressure that we don't know if we're gonna be able to stand. Help us to call on your mercy and your grace at that time. Because you never meant for us to do this in our own strength. All you really want is our heart. I thank you, Lord God. And I thank you, Lord, for addressing that spirit of religion that tries to make us think that there is any way that we could possibly earn your favor. That spirit that tries to make us think that because we follow a certain ritual and pattern, we are walking in your will. We stand against that spirit of religion in the name of Jesus. We bind every principality and every power that would lie to us and call it good, that would lie to us and call it God, that would oppress us and call it the spirit of the living God. We take authority over that spirit in the name of Jesus. We are children of the spirit and we will walk in the spirit of God. We bless you, Lord God. We bind the spirits of control that would attempt to dictate what goes on in the house of God without tapping in to the source, the spirit of the living God. And we bind the spirits of rebellion that would attempt to, to, to redirect the plan of God in their own interest. We stand against you in the name of Jesus. We're children of God. We know how to discern the times. We will not follow anyone but the spirit of God. We thank you, Lord God, for your grace, for the grace to obey you in our family relationships, for the grace to obey you in our job situations, for the grace to obey you in our ministry to one another, Lord God, and our ministry to you. And we thank you, Lord God, that no weapon that is formed against us shall prosper. And that every tongue that rises up against us in judgment, it shall be condemned because we're children of the light. We're children of the spirit of God. And we thank you, Lord, that as we line up and begin to discern the times and, and move on the times, that your glory is coming to rest upon us. God, the glory of the Lord, Lord Jesus, you will call our children from nations, Lord God. Many of us will touch nations, Lord God. Many of us will go to places that we could never go because we are now walking in the spirit of God, walking and discerning the times. And now we become a voice and a mouthpiece, God for what you're doing. They will look to us and say, 
what is God saying? And we will have the answer because we're connected to God, because we're discerning the times, Lord God. And you will find us wherever, Lord God, whenever you come, you will find us in the center of your will. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. And you won't find us backbiting. You won't find the jealousy because we'll all be moving in the plan of God for our lives. This is your promise to us, God. So we thank you for the glory that shall be revealed. We thank you for the grace to walk this walk. We thank you, Lord God, for helping us to see the signs of the things that are going on and to acknowledge that you're moving. We pray, Lord God, that you would help us to line up with the vision that you have us under, even while we're hearing from you and walking in obedience. I thank you that you love your people with an everlasting love. And there's nothing, nothing that you won't do for us as we call upon you. And so we thank you for hearing our prayer this morning, Lord. Bless us, oh God. In the name of Jesus, we thank you.